Thanks, it's great to be here. Um, as uh, Kristen said, I'm somewhere between at the University of Copenhagen and New York University in a temporal sense. I'm also somewhere in between in a geographical sense, apparently. <laughs> so um, I'm going to talk about the challenge of general video game playing. Um, I've uh, made, uh, I've emphasized general here because I do talk a lot about challenges of video game playing. And I'm not talking about like missing a lot of sleep, but making AI that plays video games and designs video games and so on. But now I'm getting into the general part as well. Um, so, previous speakers have talked about AI and general AI and a bit about logic-based systems and board games. Um, i kind of move this a bit so I don't, yeah. Um, in contrast, I'm going to talk about video games. Um, in video games, um, you have the situation that there's just lots of things moving around. You have this semi-continuous space and time. Things don't necessarily move in fixed chunks, um, things don't move in turns. The environment often changes independently of what the player does. Like things move around the other side of the screen, it might not be your fault. Um, you might have no influence of it. Um, if you do nothing in a game, um, or like take lots of random actions, you're absolutely not guaranteed to get to the end of the game. Um, you could go on, in most games, uh, video games, just not winning, not losing, just not getting anywhere. This might sound like a trivial point, but it's actually a very important point, which poses major differences for some of the algorithms that are used in um, general video game playing. Um, generally, you just have to accept that you don't know what's going to happen. I mean, things might happen, it might not be your fault as an agent, as a player, um, and uh, it might be random, it might be someone else's fault, it might be, um, the cause and effect relationship might be so complex that you can't do anything about it. You just have to get on with it. Um, also, finally, in video games, there's a lot of fun to be had. Um, I'm not saying that I'm doing this research because it's fun, but you know, that's, it, is, it is an okay position to take. Um, right, so I've been working for quite some time with video games as AI test beds and benchmarks. Basically, I was, once upon a time, um, I tried to become a philosopher. I was too impatient for that, so I went into artificial intelligence and tried to work with robotics, and I was too impatient for that because the robots were too slow um, and uh, broke down all the time, and, and I don't like getting my hands dirty. So I went into video games because I, I thought I could do the same thing as, as robotics in games, and I discovered, actually, that's not true because video games has even more interesting problems to work on. Video games really are, like you would know, where we have all these interesting problems. So um, within the sort of computational and artificial intelligence video games community, we work on problems such as StarCraft, Super Mario Bros, Torx, the car racing game here, Unreal Tournament 2004, the first person shooters. Um, um, uh, lots of interesting problems in all of them, in terms of both playing them, generating levels for them, um, adapting them to players, understanding players, etc. Now the problem we talk about um, uh, when you talk about um, um, playing games as a controller of a fitting. So we've had these competitions in all these three games you see here, StarCraft, Super Mario Bros, um, and Torx Car Racing, that people submit, we have, we have these competitions, and people submit controllers, and the controllers do better and better and better, and in the end, for example, the Torx Car Racing competition, I was part of starting this back in 2007, and it's run until last year. And you know, we got more and more interesting submissions that play this game very, very, very well. But as um, previous speakers, such as Kristen, have been uh, pointing out, um, that isn't necessarily intelligence. They couldn't do anything else at all. I mean, the Torx controller cannot play Super Mario Bros. or StarCraft, and vice versa. Um, so while it is interesting to develop, to sort of, to develop a, um, something that plays Torx or StarCraft very well, it will be more interesting, right, to develop something that could play all of them. So that's why we're sort of inspired by this general game playing um, that we've heard about. We thought of like, let's do this for video games in an interesting way. With the same AI. I mean, this is your favorite AI, right? Can uh, learn to play all of them. Just what do you think you're playing? Um, so the general video game playing competition um, ran for the first time this year at the Computational Intelligence and Games Conference. 
Um, I'm part of the organizing team, even though the first person here, Diego Perez, um, uh, um, has done like, you know, an extreme amount of work and really done most of the footwork here. I'm one of the people that's just basically um, uh, point with a whole hand and, you know, say that things should happen. Um, uh, um, and it's a competition about general game playing, um, which we continue to plan, I mean, we, we, we plan to continue running in upcoming years. Um, the way it works is that the competitors, which could be anyone, tenured academics or people from students or people from the general population, maybe you, submit a controller. That's a program written in Java currently, though we do have interfaces for other languages as well, but we will improve the support for other languages. The game engine, um, let's, um, which is submitted to our webpage, lets uh, these controllers play a number of unseen games and scores them. So basically, you get a number of games you can test the ga um, uh, controller against for yourself and uh, see what it does. But the games for the competition, you don't know these games. You've never seen them before. Maybe nobody has seen them before. Um, and, then, and, uh, and scores them, and the one who plays best over a large set of games is the winner. The games are written in what we call the video game description language. Um, the video game description language is something we developed as a group um, by basically looking at a bunch of classic arcade games. We're talking about um, the Atari 2600 era or early Commodore 64 games, early NES games, and looking at what they have in common and how we can represent this in a language. So these games are, it has, you have these pixely things that move in 2D, um, and much of the logic of the game, much of the game rules has to do with how these things interact when they touch each other. And we found out that we could describe a large number, probably, I mean, the vast majority of games on the Atari 2600 um, in some version of this logic. Maybe not in all their details, but um, the basic idea is that these games could um, be described in this sort of format of 2D things that move around and touch each other. So we came up with this um, language, which is supposed to be compact, human readable. It's not really made for reasoning. Reasoning is an AI technique. Um, and you probably could do it, but it's not made with that in mind. It's made with um, human readability in mind. And we have game engines in Java and Python. Um, uh, we use the one in Java for the competition because it's about 100 times faster, which is good. Um, well, necessary, actually. Um, so here's an example of what a whole um, game program looks like, or a whole game definition. Um, so this is a simple game um, where you move around and you collect keys, kill monsters, and head for the exit. Let me walk you through it. First you have this. Separately, you have levels separately that describes the levels. You have this level mapping that basically says um, when you read a level file, what sort of characters in the level file will map to what kind of things in the game. So G here maps to a goal, plus to a key, A to an avatar without a key, and a one here to a monster. Then you have the sprite set. The sprite set is sort of the ontology of the game. It describes what is there. So we have, we have things such as goal. A goal is an immovable object. It's green. Um, in later version of the language, we've had actually added more graphical capabilities. Now we have silly little sprites as well. Um, we have a key. It also can't move. It's orange. A sword is a thing that only exists for a short while. It's a flicker. Um, you can only have five of them in total on, on screen. Um, or you can only have five of them in total. Um, and uh, it, only one of them exists at a time. That's a single ton. Then we have a category of movables. Um, so the avatar is immovable. He's a shoot avatar. He can shoot. It's a sword. And um, he shoots the sword. And both no key and with key are types of avatar. Monster um, is a random NPC, something that moves around randomly. So you get, you get generally. Here, here you basically describe what is there in the game. What do these things do? Interaction set is what most people would call the game rules. So this is what happens when things um, uh, when things interact, when two different things in the game touch each other, what's going to happen? So uh, as you all know, when you, when you think about all these arcade games, um, 
very different things can happen. Maybe something will get eaten, something will die, you'll get score, you lose score, all these sort of things. So here, we for, see for example that anything that moves and touches a wall has, has to stop there and go back. So you can't go through walls. Um, if you don't have a key, you cannot enter the goal. Um, if the monster touches the sword, um, the sword, um, uh, no, not the sword, the monster dies. If you change the order of this statement, the sword would die instead, which would be not so good. Um, if the avatar touches the monster, then the avatar dies, etc. Um, finally, you have uh, these things um, uh, that decide when to win or lose the game. So if you if there's no goal left because you took the goal, so to speak, then you win. Or if there's no avatar left because you died, then you lose. Right. The termination set can be much more complex than this, but usually quite simple. So we, we basically found out that you know this general pattern works for describing a whole set, a whole lot of games. So here's an example. Here's uh, what, what it can look like. The avatar, little funny guy up there in the corner, um, is green. Um, and he's collecting honey and avoiding bees. And also, um, yeah, these green things we call um, are apparently called zombies in this game. This is just a completely made up game. Let's take an example of something you know. Um, how many here have, play, have played Boulder Dash? Okay, quite a few of you. The rest of you are too young. Or too old. <laughs> I mean, it's like, it's a fun, many of you would have heard about Boulder Dash, right? Yeah, many of you heard about Polodash. Fantastic, classic Commodore 64 game where you dig around in, um, uh, in Earth, you, um, you collect diamonds, you avoid things that are chasing you, and you avoid, there's a lot of sort of trickiness with various, uh, with, with making stones fall on top of other monsters and avoid getting squashed by stones itself. So it's basically a combination of a, an action and a bit of a puzzle game. So here's our, our encoding of Polodash. Um a relatively simple version of Boulder Dash, but it is actually a completely playable game, and it's all of it. Um, um, uh, and the interaction set here is the biggest part. This is um, all of these different um, rules that, um, um, uh, that can um, that apply. Um, let me see, here's a screenshot and of how it looks. Um, um, and I'm also going to show you how um, it looks being played. Um, it will be played now by one of my students. We just got a video today. There are some visualization artifacts where it looks like the stones, the stones are jumping. It's not true. The stones are not jumping. It's a visualization artifact because our game engine has a couple of visualization issues. So basically, here we have the green man running around collecting diamonds. He let um, not getting squashed by a stone um, and Avoiding getting squashed by these stones as well. Uh, the stones fall down there, collecting more diamonds. Pretty clever playing, getting chased by a monster. Um, and you see the, um, the yellow meter here is how many diamonds he has. Now he has enough diamonds. Um, and uh, I don't know what he's doing here. Oh, he's trying to kill that monster, which he failed for some reason. <laughs> yeah. And he's heading for the uh, for the exit, which is here. I don't know why he's doing this. It's just, <laughs> oh, he wants more diamonds. He's a greedy bastard. <laughs> ah, right. Yeah, so actually this interplay between diamonds and stones is pretty intricate. It's very easy to sort of basically get yourself stuck by um, uh, making all the stones fall around, fall down around you. Good, he won, excellent. Nice guy, he's been playing this too much. Um, so, um, <laughs> right, or maybe we should make better levels. Um, so the whole toolkit also comes with a whole bunch of sample controllers, including such simple things as random, which just takes random actions, which as you might expect is not very good and does not win very many games. And those games which can be won by taking random actions probably have a problem and should be um, made harder. Um, a one step look ahead, which is a sort of simpler kind of greedy agent, he sort of simulates the next step around him and looks at which one of, um, in the next step, what would put him in the best position and chooses that. Um, it is a slight improvement of random, um, but it really sort of gets you stuck in lots of different places. Monte Carlo research, 
as uh, we heard about in the previous talk. Um, it's a very popular algorithm right now. It's one of the example algorithms as well. It looks a number of steps ahead, does a statistical average. Um, because we cannot guarantee that we get to the end of the game, <clears throat> it has to have a heuristic function, which is pretty complicated. And it, this works relatively well in some games, not all of them. It also comes with, for example, a genetic algorithm um, that tries to, at any, at any given time step, tries to evolve the best sequence of future actions, which is a very, very non-standard use of a genetic algorithm, but works. So here's an example of a random guy playing Baldur Dash. Um, not very good. Not very good at all. Yeah. Oh, he's dead. Um, he let the monster out and died. Here's an example of Monte Carlo Tree Search playing Baldur Dash. The first thing you can, um, you'll see is that he doesn't do anything immediately super stupid. He doesn't kill himself. But he also spends a lot of time just running around at one edge um, of the screen because he, because he can't see any further. His rollouts, his sort of random simulations of what he's going to do, um, don't actually stretch further. And now it's like, I think in this, in, in this case he actually does win in the end, but he doesn't do it in a super sensible way. I mean, all this running around in the middle. Yep, that's the end. Good, he won. Here's... Um, uh, Space Invaders, or we call it Aliens, so it's a version of Space Invaders. You all should know what Space Invaders are. If you don't know what Space Invaders are, I mean, I don't know, you're not qualified to use a computer. <laughs> um, uh, so, as you can see, he's very bad at hitting, hitting the aliens here. Um, the numbers, by the way, is, some, is an, another visualization <coughs> artifact that, yeah, he died. Here's MCTS, um, doing slightly better. It might not look very intelligent, but if you look at the numbers, it actually, he actually does play quite a bit better. He's just much better at hitting the aliens. Um, and here's um, Frogs, which is our version of Frogger. This is a greedy agent. In Frogger, you're supposed to sort of... Oh, he died. <laughs> That's, um, in Frogger, you're supposed to, to first avoid all these sort of cars that move around here, then jump on these logs and get to the exit. Um, it's one of these classic arcade games. Let's, let's, whoop. let's watch this again. Yeah, obviously he's not doing anything very clever here. Here's another one-step controller with a different heuristic. Winning the game. Because that heuristic actually sort of tries to minimize the distance to the goal. Here's an MCTS controller. Looks clever in the beginning. Somewhat, somewhat. But that stuff, I mean, basically he got himself stuck there and got run over by a car. Not very good. Here's our, we call this a Columbus controller, which rewards exploration, an MCTS-like thing, um, which actually, yeah, almost, almost, <laughs> but, but, yeah, no, not quite. <laughs> um, um, so close, but yeah, no cigar. Um, so um, we have a bunch of these games um, um, uh, implemented. Here's um, a table of the different design features of the game. Thanks. So we have Aliens, which is uh, Space Invaders, Boulder Dash, which is Boulder Dash, Butterflies is a game we made up, um, Chase is a very simple game, Frogger, Missile Command, also classic arcade classic, Portals is a form, a, 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 an attempt at a 2D rendition of a portal-like game. Um, Sokoban is Sokoban, was a famous puzzle game. Zelda is a very sort of simple, minimalistic version of the, of, of the core Zelda gameplay. So these were all known at the beginning of the competition. That's a, that's a training set. Now, here's the validation set. Um, validation set was not known to players at the beginning um, of the game, um, but they could submit to the, um, to the website and test the controller on the validation set. Um, after the end of the competition, we of course released it. Includes um, some variation. It includes Pac-Man, which you all know what it is. Sequest is also based on an existing um, uh, Atari 2600 games. Whack-a-mole as well. Um, and there's a couple of other weird things, including such things as Camel Race, which is an outlier game where you, the way to win is it basically press the left button all the time, and then you will win. Um, surprisingly, many of the AI controllers fail to do that. We'll get back to that. <laughs> 
Um, and then we have the secret tested games. So as you can see, we sort of cat categorized which types of different design features we had in there, and then um, decided to sort of um, try to balance this between the test and validation and, um, and training set. We had 14 controllers submitted from three different continents. Um, some are basic and modified versions of the sample controllers, some are completely original, which might or might not be a good thing. Um, they're scored by playing the unseen test set, and uh, we can see what, what it looked like. This is the results on the training set. Um, we see the sample Monte Carlo tree search algorithm, just the third one on the list, doing pretty well. It got in third place on, on the training set. Um, but Adrien CTX, which is um, by a guy called Adrien Contre, I think, working in Taiwan currently, um, outperformed the other one slightly. Um, and uh, the thing called Jinjiari, which is also Taiwan, a Taiwanese agent, also performed really well. Um, we have a couple of, so, so here's the um, validation set, which looks broadly similar with a couple of, and a couple of differences, including particular G1 here, which is camel race, where basically all of the really advanced algorithms fell through completely and got almost no score. Um, whereas something called Ideal Standard, which is named after a popular toilet brand in the UK. Um, <laughs> true, I didn't name it. Um, uh, uh, actually got full score um, because it used some sort of path planning in actual physical space, which the other ones didn't. Um, and here's the scores on the, um, on the secret games in the test set. Um, so we have Adrien CTX as the winner. So the state of the art currently is that Monte Carlo research with a simple heuristic, um, which includes um, the distance to the goal and like score, does well, third place overall, but completely fails for some games, um, such as the camel race, we need to get to the end of the game, because it just doesn't see far enough, it doesn't roll out actions far enough, and it basically fools around not getting anywhere. Um, the winner, Adrian CTX, thanks, um, uses open loop Expectimax tree search, it is a tree search variant. Um, it is not too far removed from what they call a tree search, but different in some senses. Um, the second is essentially a flat Monte Carlo, which means nothing to many of you, but it's a surprisingly simple approach. Um, but that rewards exploration. And the fourth is Q learning, um, which is a standard reinforcement learning approach. Um, so, so, this was the first time we ran this competition. Let's look at where we're going. So we will, of course, run the same track for a second year. Um, we will make various improvements to the engine, um, uh, probably introduce new language features to some extent, um, and, uh, and run it again uh, for a second year and allow people time to develop their approaches, develop the algorithms. And I mean, these competitions are only really meaningful when you run them many times. We will also include a learning track where you're not given a model of the game you have to learn it, and you get some time to learn to play it before you score it. We're thinking of an oracle track where you sort of get a lot more information than you get currently, and you can try to sort of run out from, the, you, you can try to give it any state in the game and see where, what would happen. And we're also, we have an extension of video game description language to continue state games. It actually works in the Python the implementation, mm -hmm. but it's too slow currently, so we need to work, need to work on that. Um, and re-implement some core functionality in Java because the Python implementation, no, it looks pretty, but no. Um, games with partial observability um, uh, are going to be um, implemented as well. Two-player games is on the list, and yeah, generally more games, better UI. We want to make it better to play for, um, for humans as well. We have this vision where you can just go into a website and play and actually compare your own performance with AI play against the AI, play with the AI, and so on. Um, another very important part of the future here is that um, um, the level generation track and the game generation track. So here I'm going to stick my neck out and be, be ideological. I don't think game playing should be considered on its own. It should be considered in the context of um, developing games, like automatically generating games, and in context of generating content for the games, levels particularly, which I, I do a lot, essentially. Um, in these tracks, um, 
you will be given a level and asked, and, and asked to submit an agent that generates game rules for that level, or you will be given a um, game rules and generate a level for those game rules. So it can be tested with other agents and possibly also, also judged by panels of humans. Um, and this is basically because we have this loop where, I mean, playing ability makes no sense to measure unless you have good games, and game quality makes no sense to measure unless you have good players. And we need to sort of get this loop going. We have game playing agents and game generation and level generation agents feeding into each other. And in the end, we'll probably have games generated that are too hard for any human to play, and players that are better than any, than any human player, and then the computer can just keep entertaining itself. <laughs> um, and then we can do something else, right? <laughs> Go outside and play. Um, right. So that is also definitely part of the plans. It's the end of the talk. I think right on time for like we have time for a few questions. Um, just to I'd like to thank the whole GVG AI and VGDL team. It's a bunch of people. Um, we have a couple of papers out about the initial stage of development of language, um, uh, and we have Tom Shaul has a paper about the about the language as well in last year's computation intelligence and games proceedings. Um, we have a submitted um, paper about the competition in transactions of computational intelligence and AI in games, popularly pronounced T-cake, um, which you can get to look at if you ask me. Um, more information on gvgai.net. Also, finally, I'm looking for PhD students um, in New York, um, particularly working on this topic. So, thanks. Okay, so, oh, this is an interesting research question. Um, that's something someone could do a PhD on at uh, NYU, for example. But um, <laughs> basically, um, we have a couple of uh, different uh, ideas about this. Uh, so a good game um, should be um, learnable. So a bad agent should, a bad agent um, should um, be very bad at it and not win at it. A good agent should win. An agent that has learning capabilities should be able to learn to play it better. So we have a learning curve, and preferably this is a long and smooth learning curve. This like ties into lots of ideas in psychology and in game design, which are sort of independent of each other, but, um, but, fit, but fit in. Um, there's also a couple of different, you can also have metrics about that different agents should play differently, that there should be different strategies that lead, uh, that lead to the win, so it's not sort of you know, one dominant strategy at each particular point. Um, you could look at the diversity and entropy in different types of actions that are taken. Actually, there's a whole list of these things. But yeah, I mean, I would say that the learnability and the skill differentiation is the main idea behind the various ideas on, on, on measure, automatically measuring game quality.